Okay, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Gita Mehta and I work at the University of Toronto and I am going to speak to you today about how to support women and my title is uh, 10 tips to support women in academia. I think all of you recognize that women are underrepresented in all spheres of scholarly activities in academic medicine and that includes le includes leadership roles, full professorships, there is a wage gap they are less likely to be nominated and receive awards. They are less likely to be invited to speak at grand rounds and at conferences. They are less likely to participate in clinical practice guidelines, task forces, and as journal reviewers. And this has significant implications for women, of course, because all of these activities are desired by women and important for their advancement. We all know that diversity is important. Scholarly activities and scholarly productivity is greater when there is a gender diverse and overall diverse contribution because perspectives of people from all over the world, different professions contribute to better science. And as I mentioned, exclude, exclusion of women hurts their uh, academic productivity and uh, slows down the progression of their careers. Recognizing that we all need to support women to help them succeed, Anna Jaja, another physician from the University of Toronto and I wrote a paper on 10 strategies to use every day. And uh, I will be speaking further about some of these and I've added some others as well, but just briefly be aware of your implicit bias. Everyone should speak up about inequities, particularly men. Check your gender stereotypes amplify women's voices, be a mentor and be a sponsor, use women's professional titles, consciously aim to achieve gender balance, nominate women for opportunities, support women trainees, and ensure that scholarly activities are family friendly. And I'm gonna talk more about these. If you're in a leadership role, then it's very important that you be a role model and that you um, represent women and other underrepresented minorities on a daily basis. Don't minimize, dismiss, or ignore inequities. Take implicit bias training and ask your, the people that work with you to also do that. Have regular departmental meetings where you would address issues reg regarding bias or harassment. Invite feedback on the culture of your group. Have a complete non-tolerance for harassment and unprofessionalism. Nominate and propose the women who work under you for opportunities. <clears throat> and we all know that women are more likely to volunteer to organize parties and buy the baby shower gift, but make sure these responsibilities are distributed fairly amongst men and women. Don't convene mammals. In 2016, the sepsis 3 guideline document was published, which is a useful document for people around the world. Many noted that all of the authors, 19, were men. There was no representation of allied health. There was no representation from low and middle income countries, and all but one of the authors were white. There are other uh, guideline panels and uh, task forces that also lack women. And of, in this study of uh, 10 guidelines, uh, the representation of female physicians ranged from zero in many of them to 16%. So it's not, it seems to be uh, a common issue. Based on the sepsis 3 document, I and many other engaged authors around the world, men and women, interprofessional, interdisciplinary, produced a perspective that was published in the Blue Journal. And this perspective was endorsed by 15 societies around the world. And it uh, presented a review of the empirical evidence on uh, better science and more applicable guidelines produced by diverse groups. Within the document, we suggested five feasible strategies to reduce gender disparity. That included the establishment of diversity policies, or panels such as this one, that explicit reporting of the principles and methods of panel composition be mandatory, 
that the metrics of women's representation on, on panels for definition documents, consensus statements and practice guidelines be published, that explicit gender parity policies be incorporated into all areas of academic critical care, and that training on diversity and unconscious bias be mandatory for all critical care academ academics, particularly those in leadership roles. We identified that women are underrepresented at five critical care international conferences. At the bottom, the European Society, the Brussels Conference, Society of Critical Care Medicine, our Canadian Congress, Congress and the UK um, Intensive Care Society meeting. And between 2010 and 2016, the overall representation of speakers that were female physicians ranged from 7% to 18%. The Society of Critical Care Medicine showed improvements over time, as did the UK Intensive Care Society, but the other Congresses did not. So don't exclude women as speakers, faculty, or plenary speakers which means measuring and having a target and meeting that quota. And if you don't meet the quota, find other women. There are studies that have shown that if women are including on convening committees, the likelihood of having more women as speakers increases. Don't agree to be a participant on a mantle or an all male panel. And we've all seen examples of this, including these ridiculous ones, women in math, which had to be canceled because of an outcry. If you're invited to be on an all male panel, decline and explain why you're declining and uh, suggest a few women to take your place. And we have a wonderful colleague, male colleagues around the world who have publicly declared on social media not to participate in manals. Not having women or underrepresented minorities on panels as suggests that their voices are not important. <clears throat> women have been underrepresented as grand round speakers. And this was one study from an American university that showed that the percentage of intramural speakers and extramural speakers at grand rounds was one in three women and one in four women. And we all know that extramural speaking opportunities are highly prestigious. They often come with an honorarium, a trip to another city. Uh, they're good for our careers uh, because we're introduced to potential mentors and mentees. When the number of these speakers was normalized to the workforce, the representation was about 50% of medical students, same for residents, and about 60% of faculty. So do invite qualified women as intramural and extramural speakers, have a system, for example, alternating years of woman versus man, and elicit suggestions from your diverse committee. Many scholarly activities are scheduled early in the morning and after work, and that's understandable so that they don't interfere with clinical activities. However, this kind of scheduling excludes both men and women who have obligations at home, whether this be young families more commonly or elderly parents. So having a, pro, uh, having a policy, for example, this Brown University memo, whereby family friendly scheduling is used for scholarly activities so that women and men with young families are not excluded, improves um, our, able, our ability to participate. The Canadian Institute for Health Research is um, our national funding body. And last year, these data were published showing that women are much more likely to be um, funded. And when they are funded, they receive lower amounts. And this is not just a Canadian issue, it's an international issue. So when you are asked to sit on a grant review committee, do evaluate the science, do evaluate the scientist in terms of their productivity, but don't take into consideration the sex of the scientist. Mentorship and sponsorship are both very important. Mentorship shows women doors. Mentorship is uh, essential for the success of an individual. 
Sponsorship is different. Sponsorship, the meaning of it is for um, a more uh, experienced and advanced uh, individual who has a, a large uh, circle or network to introduce women, uh, young women, into that network and to uh, promote these women for specific opportunities. And sponsorship has been shown to um, increase women's partic participation in scholarly activities um, and improve their research and academic success. Don't impose gendered behavioral expectations. Agentic and communal characteristics are um, a, a set of characteristics that have been associated with men and women. Uh, and uh, agentic characteristics include assertiveness, aggressiveness, ambition, competition, independence, and being outspoken. Communal characteristics have been traditionally associated with women, nurturing, kind, sympathetic, sensitive, agreeable, warm, and caring. And um, we all have biases regarding this behavior. And we uh, expect and assume that leaders should have agentic characteristics and that women should have more communal, maternal, nurturing characteristics. However, when women uh, leaders show these agentic characteristics, they pay a social penalty. They are criticized. They are seen as less warm. And when women exhibit um, the more feminine communal, communal characteristics, they're actually criticized because they're not seen as competent as men. And there was this uh, Harvard Business Review article called The Double Bind, Damned If You Do, Damned If You Don't. So don't impose gendered behavioral expectations. Be aware of these biases and always remember that what's okay for a man is okay for a woman. Women are interrupted much more often, including um, during the Trump and Clinton debates. Trump interrupted Clinton, Clinton 51 times, and she interrupted 17 times. Supreme Court judges who are women are also more likely to be interrupted than men. We've all been in situations where a woman has presented an idea which has not been acknowledged, and several minutes later, a man presents the same idea, and he is um, accoladed for that. Use statements such as, why don't we let her finish her thought? Or statements such as, I think Arthi suggested that several minutes ago. Arthi, why don't you expand on that? Don't be a passive bystander when you witness bias, harassment, uh, innuendos, or any kind of gendered statements. Do be an active bystander. And there's a nice uh, article from Vox uh, Clematis published in 2019, which actually gives specific suggestions on how to respond to um, statements when you happen to be an act, uh, passive bystander, such as, really, what did you just say? Dr. X is so capable. I'm really looking forward to seeing her in this role. I have three young children and no one ever says this to me. That's a very personal question. Let's change the subject. We're not supposed to comment on people's appearance in the workplace. You never know how it's going to be perceived. And then speak to the woman afterwards if you witnessed something that was not right. It acknowledged that it was not right. I'm sorry he said that to you. It's not okay and it shouldn't happen. Don't use gender terminology. For example, in 2019, I noted that letters to the ed editor for resuscitation were addressed with, dear sir. So I wrote a letter to the editor suggesting it was time to drop the sir because gendered um, uh, language imposes a gender stereotype that associates men with, for example, the editor-in-chief position. And I said that while there's value in tradition, language evolve, evolves. Gender terminology is a language of exclusion. <clears throat> Non-binary, gender-neutral language is inclusive and free of stereotypes and biases. Other examples of this are chairman. Don't assume trainees don't experience gender bias or harassment. There is uh, plenty full literature now indicating that men and women trainees are judged very differently. And that includes gendered um, expectations about their behavior and leadership qualities. 
Do support trainees speak up and direct them to resources. If you witness discrimination, abuse, or harassment, speak up. Beyond us helping women, there are things that women can do to help themselves. And this is not to imply that women are the fix to this. The fix is um, a cultural uh, fix, which we all need to contribute to. But women can also um, do things on a daily basis to help themselves succeed. For example, get over the imposter syndrome. Speak up and contribute your opinion. Don't sit uh, in a back seat, sit at the table. Find at least one mentor. Ask for sponsorship. Be direct. For example, can you recommend me for that conference? For example, can you invite me to review a paper? Learn how to negotiate and there's formal negotiation training. It's okay to prioritize your family and say that you can't attend 6.30 or 7 a.m. meetings. Accept invitations can when you can and solicit invitations. Be a good citizen, but don't offer to plan every party and buy every gift. Come up with a vision and values for your academic career and politely decline activities that don't fit. If interrupted, say, I wasn't done speaking. Introduce yourself using your professional title and correct people when they don't use it. Women are much more likely to be addressed by their first name than men. In response to gendered comments, say, I'm not comfortable with what you said. And to end, I want to quote Dr. Mae Jemison, who was um, an engineer, a physician, and the first woman in space. When people think about why it's important to have a diversity of talent in a field, they think of it as a nicety. It's not a nicety, it's a necessity because we get better solutions that benefit us our, and our patients and the community. Thank you.